Man, I'm, I'm so impressed by the by the vision they've got, and uh, starting off with a, from a, from a problem solving position with Casper. Yes, Casper. With Casper, yeah, and then transitioning into the visioneering position they are now. It's just been really good to watch. I think it's really exciting. I'm really excited to be here for you guys uh, when WCA is just launching in Singapore. I believe you have an opportunity to create a model for how chiropractic can be for a lot of other countries. Mm. A lot of other countries. And while Singapore is, is really quite small, you're in a position where you can really create something new and there's a lot of other countries that currently have got no association and have got no board and they've got no guidelines. And if you can create a model that works, then we'll have a chance that those other countries have an alternative. Because at the moment they really don't have much of a choice. They've only got you know, what's going on in Australia or what's going on in the UK or what's going on in the US as a model to use and, and they're, as you probably know, really really terrible models that we don't want to be emulated. So I'm very excited for you and I'm, and I'm sure that you're going to step up. You're all looking really young and enthusiastic <laughs> and it's great. One of the big problems, as I see it, is that for uh, subluxation-based chiropractors, people who practice what I would consider to be true chiropractic, our purpose in practice is to help people to express themselves and to grow and become more of what they can be. W would you agree? Yes, to help people to achieve more of their potential, be more of who they can be. But people who like to spend time sitting on boards and controlling other people are the kind of people who tend to like uh, having power over other people and stopping other, other people from being who they are and from making other people do things the way that they would like to see things being done. And it's a real problem because it means that very few of the subluxation-based chiropractors end up going into political positions on boards. And, and that's a large part of the reason why we've got the problem that we've got. So you guys are in a position where you can really set up a board that's working the way that it should be from the beginning so you won't have the painful process of trying to change it later. You're in a, a fantastic time to be doing this and you're really fortunate because so much of the hard work has already been done by Pete and by WCA Australia. As it would seem to me, although he said you need, you, know, you need to go through and you need to make sure it's designed for the way you want it that's in alignment with your philosophy and your purpose, I reckon to a very large degree you'll be able to just take the work that Pete's already done and just transplant it into the situation you've got here. So my role in, uh, in being here, of course, is to help uh, your practice to be more efficient, help you to be more organised, help you to be able to dot your I's and cross your T's, help you to be able to raise your standards in practice so that you can do better care, help to free up the times for the doctors so they can focus more on the patients, help to, help to free up the time of your CAs so they can spend more time doing whatever it is that you want them to do. And I know Pete was talking a bit about reducing CA numbers, and we've certainly got a number of practices that have done that. But given the, si the situation that you're in here, where you've got an amazing opportunity for growth, I would see that freeing up time for CAs and freeing up time for DCs is going to be more opportunity for you to build more satellite practices and yeah. build the chiropractic bigger. Yeah. Yeah, wouldn't you think? Yeah. Because there's, there's no shortage of new patients in your country, from what I'm hearing. It's a fantastic time to be. So I would really love to be involved in that by providing the tools so that you can be more efficient in your practice, you can actually go out there and have the time to not only build chiropractic more, but spend more time with your families as well. All right, so we know that people come into our practice as a lead, right? We have some, for some reason, they've gone into our database and we're gonna try and book them in for initial consult. Yeah. But then the next stage that happens is actually book in for initial consultation. The thing that happens after that is that they turn up for their initial consultation, right? The third thing is that they uh, turn up for their R1, and then turn up their R23, and then if we're doing well, they're going to sign up for a course of care, and then after that, they're going to complete that course of care, um, go to an R4, uh, then they will go from their final R4 to an R5, and then from their R5, they're going to sign up for another program of care, and then once they start on the next program of care, the next thing is probably another R5, you might not, maybe you have an R4 in there, depending on the program they're in. So we can see that our patients go through clearly defined steps in their course, so we want to know how many of them convert from one step to the next, and that's what this report is designed to do. So we can see that in this in this practice, from initial consultation to R1, it was 92%, that doesn't seem too bad. From R1, from R1 to R2, so the number of people came to R1 who turned up with R2 is 100%, that's probably what most of you get. It's not very many people drop out between R1 and R23, is it? R23 to starting care, we can see it's 78%. That's not so good. Starting care to R4, 67%. And then R4 to R4, so we've got multiple R4s within the program, 92%. So we can see that people are dropping out most commonly in that initial three-month period. So we know that that's where our weakness is, that's where we need to focus, and we're going to 
improve our longevity of our patients and help people to stay under lifetime, lifetime wellness care. Now, has anybody, does anybody here actually calculate conversion stats in their practice? You do? Yeah? Yeah? We actually found it's, it's really remarkably difficult to calculate accurately. Because if you want to calculate them accurately, you need to track them for a given individual. So, for example, if we measure the number of initial consultations we had in a month, and we measure the number of R1s that we had in a month, and we say, well, we'll just divide one or the other, we get our conversion rate, that's not, in fact, correct, is it? Because some of those people that came in, in the, for the R1 in that month actually had their initial consultation the previous month. And some of the people who had their initial consultation in this month will do their R1 in the next month. And if you've done a big promotion, especially you know, at the end or the beginning of one of your months, then your stats are going to be all off, right? So actually really hard to keep track of, aren't they? Yeah, really hard to keep track of. Barry's down the back nodding away. So that's why we designed this, because I was trying to fill in these forms for WLP, and I'm trying to like put in my conversion stats, I'm trying to work them out, and it was so hard, and uh, there was no software, and to my, the rest of my knowledge, still to date, there is no software that allows you to do that. Um, we're tracking them manually in spreadsheets, and it was really hard work, and really, I just don't think our stats are really all that accurate, even though we were trying really hard, my CAs were really trying their best. Now, it's, uh, you don't have to try it all. So as long as they book in and come into appointments, as soon as you press that button, all your stats come up and they're accurate. You know exactly where your strengths, exactly where your weaknesses are. I love this report. 